everyone and welcome uh, back to my uh, channel. Um, today's video is going to be a bit more serious than my usual videos um, and um, also I just want to um, start with a trigger warning before I begin. It, this does contain some material that some of you may might find a little bit um, depressing or um, upsetting so I just wanted to say that right from the beginning um, so that you can make your own mind up whether or not you want to carry on listening to what I have to say. Um, I'm going to be talking today about some new evidence that has recently come to light that you might be aware of yourself because it's been um, in the news quite a lot lately about um, Hans Asperger's um, speculated Nazi past based upon a lot of evidence that's come to light. Um, the, it appeared in the Journal of Mole Molecular Autism and the research was carried out by the medical historian Herwig Scheck, he's an Austrian medical historian, over about eight years. Uh, because in the past, particularly in the 1990s, um, it was assumed that Hans Asperger was a courageous defender of the children in his care from Nazi persecution. That he actively, um, how can I put it, he actively emphasised the positive characteristics of the children in his care. Um, their special skills, if you like, um, as a way of um, sort of trying to portray them in a positive light so that they would be less likely um, to be uh, killed, essentially, by the Nazis. But um, this, this idea, I don't quite understand how this argument personally could have been reached given the lack of evidence it, it seems rather spurious grounds if you ask me for um basing uh, an interpretation of someone's intentions um or uh, in in you know how can you jump from a Asperger emphasizing positive characteristics to him being a courageous defender of the children in his care without any other evidence to me seems a little bit yeah spurious if you ask me and um this new evidence the, the evidence that's come to light recently it assumed didn't exist because for a long time the assumption was that the evidence had been destroyed uh, by Allied bombers in, in World War II, um, but that was a fallacy. The evidence does exist and it has been found and it does not make good reading. Um, now, the new evidence that has come to light suggests that far from being a heroic defender of the children in his care, that actually Hans Asperger may have been complicit in Nazi race hygiene policies. Uh, it is suggested that far from challenging the Nazi ideology of eugenics, the therapeutic pedagogy or rehabilitation um, called a uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Heil Pedagogik, I think it's called, that Asperger advocated for his child patients in Vienna was very much in line with the Nazi view that troubled children with potential should be turned into productive members of the German collective state. This state had no room for individuality, and sought to create a homogenous so-called body politic that was genetically uniform. Children with what the Nazis termed hereditary defects were often sent to their deaths, particularly if they could not be shoehorned into line via education or therapy. Asperger himself said, and this is very troubling to read out, that if we care for these people, we will be able to take at least part of them to a point where they will not be a burden. Not be a burden. Just dwell on that line a moment. A burden. 
shocking, horrible language, and a danger to the national community. And there are um, similar, um, if not even more, um, disgusting um, sort of statements along similar lines um, but that the Nazis would often come out with. They call disabled people, for example, useless eaters. Useless eaters. You, you didn't see a disabled person as having any intrinsic worth, any human value. The, the, only, the only value anyone had in this fascist society was their value to the collective. It's worth bearing in mind because although... You know, we might think, oh, this is a long time ago, we've moved on, we're so much more enlightened these days. Actually, if you look at some of the rhetoric that's coming out these days about disabled people, there are some very troubling parallels. So, in this utilitarian view, a person only has use value and never intrinsic value as a human being, existing in their own right. Um, I mean, we must remain vigilant, we must remain vigilant, we must not forget where such an ideology can potentially lead, because it's still around today, that type of thinking. Now, therapeutic education in Nazi Vienna was considered to have a role to play in shoring up the war effort. The patients were often simply viewed as potential productive workers, and their intrinsic worth as individuals was often downplayed. And it gets even worse. There is evidence that Asperger referred some children who were considered to be so disabled that they were beyond hope to Am Spiegelgrund, a secretive killing centre. The only children that Asperger advocated for were those who promised some future benefit to society. The so-called uneducable, as if anyone can be uneducable, but that's the term they use, uneducable, and unemployable were targeted for murder. Today, in our so-called enlightened times, we still grade autism into high and low functioning. And this privileging of autistics with supposed compensatory assets is particularly troubling in light of the way that grading has historically resulted in attempts at eugenics. And the implication that some autistics are more worthy than others. This begs the philosophical question of who gets to decide what functioning well means. Functioning well for whom? For the individual or for society? And does the individual even have a say in this matter? Or is it just a collective societal imposition based upon a stereotype or an expectation? In one shocking case that has come to light in a newly unearthed evidence, in 1941, Asperger sent a 15-year-old boy to a labour education camp for work-shy youth. Get that, and this was in Nazi Vienna. This is what happened in Nazi Vienna. Work-shy youth. Similar words are used today. Because he hoped that strict discipline would help alleviate his hypochondriac symptoms. This is just one example of the authoritarian and fascist mindset that Asperger often seemed to exhibit. Asperger supported eugenics. He thought that his so-called feeble-minded patients, who might be classed as low-functioning today, posed a eugenic danger to the state. Furthermore, many of his less fortunate patients were sent to institutions where they often faced abuse on the grounds that they were constitutionally defective. Asperger was even involved in the selection of victims for child euthanasia. In 1942, he was part of a commission that screened residents of a children's home and categorised children according to intellectual abilities. You know, you're sort of thinking, and I think it's in asylums as well, high grade, low grade, high functioning, low functioning. I don't want to have anything to do with those terms, thank you very much. I mean, we just have to look at the history of these terms to see how, you know, offensive they can be, really. A group of these children were categorised as uneducable, which was a death sentence. 
This operation was illegal, yet Asperger cooperated. He cooperated when he was under no obligation to do so. Even in the Nazi, you know, society that he lived in, this was an illegal operation. So he didn't actually have to go along with it, but he did. Asperger felt that his patients with autism displayed behaviour that was in opposition to Nazi party values. So maybe, you know, that's maybe one one thing we can say as autistic people, you know, we were resistors just by being around, we resisted the Nazis, you know, we resisted fascism. You know, we could say our ancestors resisted fascism. They might not have done so consciously, some of them might have, but just by being alive, their very existence threatened fascism. It was a resistance to fascism just by being there because an autistic person just cannot fit into a fascist society because of their difference. They display behaviour as an opposition to Nazi party values. Autistic people are very individual. Fascism abhors individualism. And any behaviour that is outside of a collective group. The pursuit of one's own interests, which is actually one of the positives of autism, was seen by Asperger as threatening the state's body politic. You know, so much for this um, heroic sa um, individual who saved autistic people. He, he felt that actually threatened the body politic and needed to be you know, pushed into line through this therapeutic pedagogy. Asperger even accused autistic patients of being cruel and malicious, which suggests a curious lack of empathy and understanding on his part. It is also worth bearing in mind, as already referred to previously, that Nazi psychiatry was selectively benevolent towards so-called difficult children who had special abilities. But this benevolence did not extend to so-called less favourable cases. It's worth bearing that in mind, because even today, there's this, often there's this elitist hierarchy between a so-called high-functioning and low-functioning based upon whether a person supposedly has compensatory abilities, and it's offensive, and I don't want to be a part of that, and I don't want to be called high-functioning with the assumption that somehow I've got some special attribute that others don't have. I mean, it's offensive. People need to think before they come out with these statements. And... And I know, like, obviously many people, you know, they're not intending to be offensive. You know, they're not intending to be offensive. And, of course, if someone doesn't know the politics behind this, they might use these terms. You know, and I'm not, you know, they're not being offensive. They're not trying to offend. And I think it's important to, you know, to not jump down their throat and get all, you know, upset about it and uptight about it. Because they're not intending to be offensive. But it certainly can help to educate people. And I think, hopefully, as we move forward, we won't need to use these terms. Because they, they can cause upset, even, you know, if it is unintentional. Um, so, the evidence suggests that Asperger was an opportunist. So, I also wanted to say, so I'm jumping ahead of myself, <laughs> that due to this new evidence, there is a debate going on as to whether the label Asperger syndrome should be retained. It has, of course, already been officially excised from the DSM-5, but many still use the eponym. So the question is, what do you think? Because we all have different, you know, there's no right or wrong here. This is an open discussion. Um, but what do you think? I will probably still use the term Asperger's as I see fit. So, although these days, and more often than not, refer to myself as autistic anyway, I largely agree with Sheck that what is more important than use of terms is that we look at the past and learn lessons from it. As I, as I mentioned earlier, that's really important. We need to see all disabled people as having worth, irrespective of whether or not they can work or access mainstream education. Some argue that Asperger's history shouldn't obscure his contributions to the understanding of autism. I think that I largely agree with the notion that in science or other fields, a person's politics and character should be kept separate from any potentially useful discoveries that should be viewed objectively and on their own terms. I mean, Wagner was an anti-Semite, but that doesn't detract from the fact that his music, you know, it can be very beautiful. However, I feel uncomfortable with using Asperger's name in light of his deeply troubling past and will certainly use the term a lot more cautiously in the future. I mean, and this also has a personal dimension to me as well because my own grandmother, um, who I highly suspect was autistic, but she lost her family to the Nazi murderers who butchered her family. She was Jewish and she came over to this country in the Kinderfleet at the end of the 1930s and her most of her family were murdered by the Nazis um, in Auschwitz. 
and um, she and her siblings were lucky enough to survive and came over here and I wouldn't have been born if she hadn't crossed the seas and um, the Nazis certainly wouldn't have wanted me so it has, um, it does have some personal, um, yeah I think that's also why I'm quite passionate about this subject as well because of my grandmother who's no longer around but you know I think I, I do have a certain feeling that I should kind of in a sense um, do my bit as it were uh, to uh, not let this be forgotten, this, this history. And um, so yeah, so it has a personal aspect in, in my life as well. The evidence suggests that Asperger was an opportunist who cooperated with the Nazis in order to gain opportunities for promotion. It is very painful as an autistic person to read this new evidence, but it is important that we don't forget this dark past, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll, I'll mention it again, so that the atrocities committed by the Nazis are never allowed to happen again. It must never be allowed to happen again, because it's absolutely awful what happened, and the, all those innocent people who were killed by the Nazis, when I think about it, it just makes me feel sick to the stomach, and it must never, ever be allowed to happen again, because that ideology is still around. That's why it's scary and why we must not, we must remain vigilant so that these murders, this type, this isn't allowed to happen again. And, you know, not just, you know, obviously it wasn't just murder, but the Nazis denied whole groups of people their rights and liberties as individuals just because they threatened this um, the body, so-called body politic of the state. They had no respect for disabled people, they hated disabled people, they hated Jews, they hated gypsies, they hated a whole range of different people who did not fit into their, you know, their fascist ideology, really. There is an upcoming book that's coming that I would like to read, it's very expensive at the moment, but I would like to read it at some point, called Asperger Children, The Origins of Autism in Nazi Vienna, by Edith Schaeffer, so when it's gone down in price I might read that, so that's quite interesting. Sheffer argues that we should no longer use the word Asperger. I don't know if I'm quite made up, you know, I don't know if I would take it that far or not. I'm, I'm still a little bit sitting on a fence about this in terms of what I think about whether or not we should carry on using the term Asperger or not. Um, but what do you think? You know, I guess it, this could be the beginning of a discussion. So do let me know what you think or, or you know, and don't be, um, <laughs> don't be shy of um, uh, disagreeing with anything I've said in this video. You know, I'm open to debate and discussion. Um, if I could have put something a bit better, let me know, yeah, and just say what you think, really. So I hope this hasn't been too depressing, um, and, um, thank you for watching. Thank you. And next week, um, I'm just going to do one video today. Um, I do usually do two, but, um, this, this is really what I wanted to talk about today. Um, next week I will try and do something a little bit lighter, and maybe do, like, a book review or something. And um, I haven't forgotten that book I got in Arundel, as one of you wanted me to do a book for you on that. I will at some point. It might not be for a couple of weeks because I need to read it first. But I will certainly do it when I've read the book. So thank you for watching.